And now I'd like to welcome to the dais Jordan Green. Jordan, amongst other prominent roles in the, in the formation and leadership of Australian innovation ecosystem, is chairman of the Victorian PSC Committee and secretary of the PSE Foundation Board. Jordan. Thanks very much, Wayne. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you here. So uh, I'd like to start off, I'm first going to be talking a little bit about the Foundation, but more importantly about our awards. But before I do that, I'd like to invite the, the two recipients who should be with us tonight of past Victorian PC Entrepreneur Award to, to stand up. So Rick and Jason. So Rick in... Rick received the award in 2000, and Jason, just last year up here on this stage. So, <laughs> thank you very much. So, as we've heard, it was 25 years ago that the Foundation launched on its mission to celebrate, support and encourage Australians who engage in and excel at the invention, development and use of information, communication and computing technologies for the betterment of our society. Building on the work of Dr. Trevor Pearcey and his invention of the first digital computer in Australia, which put us at the global forefront of the digital computing age, we have recognised 161 outstanding Australians with the Pearcey Entrepreneur Award, and a further 62 have been inducted into the Pearcey Hall of Fame, 24 of whom have received the Pearcey Medal. Peer selection is the hallmark of the PSE Awards. Each year, the Foundation awards the PSE Medal for a lifetime of achievement. And I'd like to recognise Professor David Abramson, who's with us tonight, who received the medal in 2019. <laughs> the medalist, and up to two others, are inducted into the PSE Hall of Fame for their notably significant lifetime contributions to Australian ICT. Those awards, together with the National PC Entrepreneur Award, will be made later this year in Sydney at our National Awards Gala, the night of the same day on which we're holding the event for Australia 4.0 that Wayne spoke about. And I hope you'll all be able to join us for that event and celebrate some truly extraordinary Australians. Our core ethic at the Foundation is collaboration. No better example than when we celebrated this afternoon at ScienceWorks with Professor Simmons, as you've already heard. We did stand in front of the CIRAC to acknowledge the generous donation by PC Award recipient James Riggle and his BitLink IoT, Internet of Things Kits for Kids, which allow kids to experiment and create right there in their own way and learn about the technology by doing. That and other valuable equipment donations the PC Foundation has facilitated from our award recipients to the community. Our partnering with the ACS for the Australia 4.0 Summit in October, our partnering with the University of Sydney last year for the Riding the Digital Wave Summit. These are all exemplars of our commitment to being a proactive enabler of a better future for Australia through remembering, celebrating and promoting our ICT heroes and heroines. Thank you all for joining us for this special event and for your support of the PC Foundation. The Victorian PC Entrepreneur Award recognises an individual or team who has taken a risk, is making a difference and is an inspiration to others. Selected by past award recipients, this is the community recognising the significant achievements of its peers. The award is for people in the midst of their career who are leading the Australian ICT sector from the very front edge of the global stage. My special thanks to the Victorian PC Committee who give generously of their time to ensure this award continues every year with honour and integrity. This year, the Victorian PC Entrepreneur Award recognises the creation of a global success story from right here in Melbourne. This entrepreneur and his team are applying computing technology to help organisations of all sorts meet and master one of the most difficult challenges creating, maintaining and evolving 
a successful corporate culture. Born in Canberra, his family moved to Adelaide when he was just four. His mother an artist and his father a research psychologist at the University of Adelaide. His father's work gave our recipient access to computers and he started teaching himself programming and of course as a young boy hacking computer games. In year 11, he fell in love with Adobe Photoshop 1.0 while attending a week-long program at the Technology School of the Future. He chose a bachelor degree in mathematical and computer sciences at the University of Adelaide. In part, because it came with a free email address, which otherwise would have cost 20 bucks a year. <laughs> he graduated with a combined major in computers and philosophy, an early indicator of his journey to combine technology with human behavior. During university, he attended a state IT jobs fair in Adelaide, where he solved an annoying problem for a young technology company. It turns out that one piece of knowledge that they needed was all he actually knew about the topic. <laughs> but it was more than enough to get him a job as a sysadmin at that firm. And after he graduated, he worked full time as a software engineer at that company, developing technology and services for the movie industry. His colleagues there describe him as humble, patient and nurturing, with a voracious appetite for new ideas on a diverse range of subjects. He spent nearly 14 years at that company Rising Sun Pictures, now one of the great Australian success stories in visual effects and post-production. At just 26, he became CEO, overseeing the development of innovations that creatively disrupted the Hollywood film industry, including being co-author of the Academy Award-winning CineSync remote collaboration tool, which directly contributed to making globally distributed filmmaking a reality. As CEO of Rising Sun, he stood out as a thoughtful and strategic thinker. His belief in culture, strategy and values underpinned a period of accelerated growth for the business, scaling to over 150 people. And when it was time to execute the Charlotte's Web project for Paramount Pictures, he relocated the business, attracted staff through an impressive immigration effort and built technical infrastructure and production systems to support growth and scale. Even after he left the company, as an executive and a board member, he stayed connected with the commercialization of the intellectual property which he had initiated, seeing it through to the sale of products to global players THX and F-Track. In doing so, he ensured that his verbal commitments to key staff were honored and they were equity participants in those sales. Along the way, he had a chance, to, a chance encounter with the young founders of what would become another Australian success story. They were building a software business for Silicon Valley, while he was locked into the conservative business model of Hollywood. The three became good friends, and he watched over the next three years as their business exploded onto the world stage. That company is Atlassian. In 2009, he took the next big risk in his life with two young children, new opportunities for his opera singer wife in Melbourne, a burning desire to make a bigger impact on the world. Inspired by the success of his friends at Atlassian, he decided to move on and pursue his own path and vision. They moved to Melbourne and he launched his startup to provide organisational culture tracking and measurement software. His ability to grow that venture to be an Australian unicorn, valued today in excess of $2 billion, dominating its niche globally, is a testament to his core characteristics and resilience as a person, as a businessman and as a leader. A true technology innovator and an exemplary, inclusive leader and role model, throughout the journey he has remained positive and more interested in the world's effect on others than his own story. Colleagues describe this strongly values-oriented leader as someone who steps between his team members and failure, gives success away freely to those same team members, and creates an environment of trust and safe learning from failure. Even as an extremely busy person, he still finds time to call back 
and provide counsel and is generous in his support of new entrepreneurs. That passion, self-confidence, experience, motivation and team ethic were all key in convincing early customers, global players like Adobe, to take a chance on this ambitious Australian startup. The company headquarters remain in Melbourne, with offices in San Francisco, London, New York, Chicago and Berlin, all supporting a global staff in excess of a thousand people. It serves over 25 million employees across more than six and a half thousand companies of all sizes and industries to transform employee engagement, develop high performing teams and retain talent via cutting edge research, powerful technology and the largest employee data set in the world. Over the years, the company has raised over $400 million in investment capital, most recently $155 million Series F in 2021. That same year, Forbes magazine recognised the company as one of the world's top private cloud companies. And this year, Fast Company declared his company one of the 10 most innovative workplace companies in the world. Last year, he signed his company up as a founding member of the World Economic Forum's Global Parity Alliance, a cross-industry group of global organisations that are taking a holistic action to accelerate diversity, equity and inclusion in the workplace and beyond. He describes his motivation. The thing he enjoys the most is figuring out how to help people be successful. So that's what he set out to do with the software. In an effort to make his company the exemplar of what he offers his clients, he chooses to do things differently to the convention. In the early years, his salespeople did not get paid commissions. He assures me that while today they do get paid commissions, it's not like the way that gets done at other companies. And another example is how he greets each new employee. He asks them, how can I help you find your next role? This is an open recognition that jobs are not for life. It focuses on the well-being and value of each person. He describes the goal of this approach as making their time with his company an inflection point in the trajectory of their career. He observes that for most of today's companies, most of the value is intangible. That value comes from the people. Working out how to maximise what those people are capable of doing working out how to amplify what those people can be, that's how he helps his clients generate the most value for themselves. He believes enabling people that way makes culture a key source of competitive advantage. Beyond his own company, he's a non-executive director of the Atlassian Foundation, on the board of Rising Sun Research, and an advisor to companies across diverse industries. His journey is far from over. His impact, nowhere near fully realised. His adventure has many exciting episodes ahead. And I am confident each will include a material contribution to making the world a better place. Choosing the recipient for this award, as I said, is guided by three principles. Has the individual taken a risk? Is this individual making a difference? And is this individual an inspiration to others? Our recipient tonight has certainly taken risks throughout his career. He has made bold decisions, guided and driven by his values. He has chosen to do things differently, to see the world through fresh eyes and to act on his own insights. Building a culture of inclusion, equity and achievement at his company has ensured his impact and influence on the national and global stage. All of these and more mean that this man has very definitely taken a risk, made a difference, and is an inspiration. So ladies and gentlemen, without any further ado, let me tell you that the 2023 Victorian PC Entrepreneur of the Year is Didier Elzinger, founder and CEO of Culture App. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Ben Carroll MP, Minister for Industry and Innovation, to share his thoughts and then present Didier with the award. Thank you. 
That's a very hard act to follow, isn't it? <laughs> Can I begin also by acknowledging the Christian loners of the land in which we're meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging? Can I begin also acknowledging Kelly uh, as a Master of Ceremonies? And I thought Kelly made a very important point about why we need to champion innovation and technology just as we champion sport. And uh, I think the Matildas gives us a great opportunity because some of you may be aware, but three innovative Victorian companies are behind, in many respects, the success of the Matildas. Um, many of you will be aware too that uh, men and women are essentially built differently. And when it comes to sportswear, there was a real market, whether it's the, the shoes, the outfits, the undergarments, and uh, three Victorian innovative companies have helped put Matilda, the Matildas there on the world stage. But unfortunately, we don't know a lot about those companies. I do, but it's my ambition uh, to try and make them as much household names as we can. So I thought that was a very good point, uh, Kelly. Can I also acknowledge Professor Duncan Maskell, uh, vice Chancellor the University of Melbourne. Thank you, Duncan, for all you do in ICT and the sector and what you are doing at Fisherman's Bend that's going to be world-class with some world-class companies and uh, really help strengthen Victoria's market in innovation technology going forward. Uh, Wayne Fitzsimmons, OAM Chair, uh, thank you for your uh, introductory remarks and, and Jordan Green, obviously the board. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, introduction of what we're going to hear very shortly uh, from Didier. Can I also, I'm um, looking forward to hearing from Professor Michelle Yvonne Simmons. Um, it's not an arms race when it comes to quantum computing, and I know we've got colleagues here from New South Wales. Uh, I speak to Ed Husick uh, very regularly about quantum computing, and I think for right across the state, there's a real opportunity, uh, whether it's the University of Melbourne, uh, University of New South Wales, La Trobe University, uh, our partnerships with Breakthrough Victoria, to really put Australia uh, front and centre when it comes to quantum computing. And the, the knowledge in this room and how that is going to be so transformative, whether I'm speaking tonight as Public Transport Minister or uh, electric vehicles or what it's going to do in uh, just changing the nature of research and development is so exciting. I do want to thank uh, Danny Jarrett uh, for being here as well, uh, Amanda Caples, uh, the, the lead scientist and also from Breakthrough Victoria and Connie. We are uh, led by a great team uh, at the department and it's wonderful that you're all here too. And I do want to acknowledge Fran Bailey as well. Fran, thank you for being here. Um, when Wayne was speaking, I had a little bit of PTSD because I actually used to work for Senator Conroy and used to greet David Thody and then Paul Fletcher in at the parliament and let's go and talk about the NBN. Uh, so I can share some of your thoughts there and uh, look forward to a, a cup of tea later on to uh, talk some old war stories. But it's wonderful to have you here as well. It really is important uh, to be here tonight. And when the invitation came, I wanted to come uh, for, for several reasons. But it goes to the heart of what we're wanting to do here in Victoria. And that is to become the innovation powerhouse of the nation. Uh, when you think about the history of Victoria, and I was talking to Professor Muskell before, you know, the mass transit vehicle, the FX Holden coming out of Fisherman's Bend back uh, rolling out in the 1940s by Prime Minister Ben Chifley. Then you think of Boeing, Siemens, uh, you think of Bosch, you think of the world-class companies that are there plugged into the University of Melbourne School of Engineering. You see that we are going into a new era. And the Victorian government, uh, through our investments in digital technology, the digital economy, Launch Vic, Breakthrough, uh, Trade and Investment, are really wanting to be a strong partner with you. Essentially, uh, you know, the state, the private sector, the innovators coming together. Uh, and we have got a long history that we should be celebrating here in Melbourne, Victoria, whether it was innovation around the breakfast table with Vegemite, whether it was the, the, the ute being designed at the Ford factory in Geelong, uh, to, to seek, to see a sell uh, from startups to unicorns, we really do need to continue to promote innovation and technology. And one of the great things that's in our favour is that we are so much social beings here in Victoria. We love getting together, like functions like tonight, Percy, uh, the Digital Innovations uh, Week that's been here with, through the University of Melbourne. And 
that is what we're about here in Victoria, um, seeing our diversity as a strength and very much trying to make inclusivity as part of that. Uh, if we do invest in the, in the bold ideas with the talented researchers, we can have such uh, cutting edge uh, thoughts and processes going forward that will really be disruptors and be the next unicorn. And when I was listening um, about uh, Didier Alzinger and his uh, fundamentally what he's been able to achieve through technology and innovation, and I was thinking, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like a combination. I thought of, uh, you know, Robin Sharma's Five AM Club and uh, uh, Paul Allen's, uh, you know, Jim, Jim Collins' um, Good to Great, because uh, at the end of the day, it is all about culture. Um, whether it's in politics, the field that Fran and I have been in, uh, whether it's in business, whether it's in technology, whether it's in innovation. And I thought to see someone, and he listening to someone like Didier that takes that interest in his staff to be already working on what their next occupation is, says a lot about him and what he's about beyond the business, but about creating a better society and a fairer society and making sure that that employee goes off to the next workplace uh, so much stronger and so much better. So I really do congratulate you, Didier. I think that uh, your drive for continuous learning and improvement, but focusing on people first and foremost, is really to be congratulated. Uh, so I really just want to say that I think uh, what you've been able to produce through the Culture AMP, uh, I can see why it is the, the success that it is. But at the end of the day, it's about the people that are behind it and the leadership that you've shown. And I think uh, it's certainly inspired me, your story. And I hope we can continue to celebrate what you've been able to achieve with many other individuals in this room to really point out the local talent we have here in Melbourne, Victoria, and how we really can be on the world stage. So it is my great pleasure, Didier, to present you with the 2023 Victorian Percy Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur of the Year Award, and I think you should be warmly congratulated. It's an outstanding achievement. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's incredibly humbling to be up here, uh, particularly to hear that um, introduction, Jordan. It actually sounds quite impressive <laughs> when you say it like that. And I'm humbled here for many reasons. I'm both humbled and inspired in, in equal parts. Um, I wear many hats, as Jordan said. One of those is that I serve on the board of the Tech Council of Australia. And so one of our mandates is really around how do we lift the technology industry into its rightful place as a preeminent employer, as a preeminent provider and creator of value in this country. And it's been a really um, exciting moment to sort of see that opportunity. But then I look around the room, I look at the people that we have here, and I get excited about what we can do. And I don't want to take too much time because I know dinner comes after I stop talking and then we get to the oration, which is the bit that I'm really excited to hear. When I reflect a little bit on the journey to here, and I'm glad that you said mid-career, that makes me feel good. Um, I think there is, I get asked, when I was at the Rising Sun, you know, we were working for Hollywood from Adelaide, so we started that company in Adelaide. We had an office in Sydney, but most of the, most of the team was in Adelaide. And we get asked, how did we work for Hollywood from Adelaide? And then likewise, I moved to Melbourne, started Culture Amp, and we have companies all over the world. And people say, how do you build a technology company from Australia? And the answer is, I was too naive to know that I couldn't. Uh, along the way, you just sort of go and you try and things work and you turn up and a lot of these things play out. And I was sort of thinking about, you know, is there a moment, and Jordan actually asked me this on the phone the other day, is there a moment you look back on that you think really changed that for you or, or set you on that journey? And I was reflecting on the fact that I didn't wear uniform at school because my dad was a conscientious objector to uniform. <laughs> Um, but interestingly, when I reflect back on my memory of school, that's not part of my um, 
recollection. So I was obviously different, but I didn't think I was different, and that was an interesting thing. But I actually think the bigger thing you talked about in the speech, which was the technology school of the future. So this was a thing that was set up in South Australia, and it was a, a small thing down in Salisbury. And if you went to a public school, which I did, uh, you were allowed to go, your teacher had a certain amount of access to it and they could bring students along. And they had got a lot of grants from um, technology companies that provided hardware and software. And the thing that made the technology school of the future different was that was it. Like you turned up and they had, I went to this week long thing and then I asked if I could come back and they said yes. So it was actually my art teacher that introduced me to the technology school of the future. And so I went along and there was just licenses, there was no tools, there was manuals, you figured it out as you went along. And so when I think about with my you know, uh, tech council hat on, um, the WEF, uh, CEW, I was at the Chief Executive Women's today, we talk a lot about skills and we should. You know, The jobs of tomorrow are going to be different to the jobs of today. But I would put to you that the thing that is even more important than skills and training is play. And that's what the technology school of the future was. It was an opportunity for someone who wanted to play and just wanted to explore, and it kindled that in me. And so I don't think I would have ended up at Rising Sun Pictures if I hadn't had that opportunity, if I hadn't had that chance to use Photoshop 1.0. And I actually used that to create my Year 12 art prac. Um, they actually gave me a perfect score in Year 12, and I think it's because they had no idea what to do with it. <laughs> They're like, this is either zero or 100, and we're going to go with 100. But that was such an important point, and that, I think, was the pivotal moment. So when I look around and I think about what we can all do to continue to pave the way for the people that come behind us, it's not to forget that. You know, in the national agenda and all the things we need to do to reskill, to invest, to create, we also need to create space to play. We need to create an opportunity for people just to experiment, to, to think about different things, to want to do things in different ways. And when we think about culture, that's often what the most powerful cultures are. And the way I like to think about what does it mean for a company to have a really strong and powerful culture, there's something about it that makes you want to be a better version of yourself. Like you're inspired by it. It lifts you up. And that's what we want. So the first thing that I hope all of us take away from today and, and from my journey to the extent that you do is the power of play and the fact that it's not just something that is fun or silly, it's actually the basis of really great business. It's the basis of wealth creation, it's the basis of job creation, um, it's the beginning of everything, and without that we don't have much. But on the second thing, the other thing I would hope that we can do too is access to that. Because whilst it was a big thing for me, you know, I grew up relatively poor, uh, went to public school, I would never have had opportunity to have all those things. As you said, my dad was a research um, uh, psychologist, he actually had a computer, that's why I got my interest in it. I stand before you as a you know, white male full of compound privilege. I think I'm good at what I do, but there's probably a hundred people that could have done this, but never had that opportunity. Every step along the way, they weren't given that hand. And so even when we moved here to Melbourne, my wife, Greta Bradman, who's here, um, was uh, a, an opera singer. Now she is a, a technologist, she is an entrepreneur, a startup person focusing on something that even back then you were thinking about, but the world didn't see Greta as a tech entrepreneur. They saw her as an opera singer or something else. And so as we look forward over the next 10, 20 years, what we want is for the people that come up on this stage to be those people, the people that we didn't think could be the tech entrepreneurs, didn't think cared about these things, because they do. And if we give them that opportunity to play, if we give them that opportunity to have access and then we back them, because that's probably the third thing that I would think that we need to keep in mind too, is Australia has an incredible tradition of creating ideas. Wi-Fi, fax machines, in the film industry, Flame, which was a standard in our space, were all created in Australia. But they were not commercialised here. They were not developed here. They were not lifted to new heights here. And one of the things we often make the mistake on is that we get to a certain point and we think, now you need to give it to someone who's an adult. And I go back to play. No, let's back the people that had these ideas. Let's see how far they can take it. And let's let them do it from here. And I think they can. So on that note, thank you so much for this award. It means an incredible amount. Very humbled to be here and super excited to learn more about quantum computing. <laughs> thank you. Don't forget this.
Don't forget that. No. So, just blown away. I think all of you are probably feeling the same. Um, it makes us very proud and we're very delighted, but now we need some food. Uh, so I'm going to um, encourage you all to network and meet each other and, and answer that question about those different things. There's a whole lot of new areas that you've mentioned that we have um, definitely um, taken a risk and made a difference and inspired others. So thank you very much for your contribution and your continued vision, which we will definitely want to work with you on. We're going to play actually a video um, which gives you a bit of a feel of what we have achieved that you may not know about. So I do um, encourage you to have some bread and then the entree. Thank you. I think Australia has a terrific record for being inventive. There's clearly a brilliant innovative streak in, uh, in Australians. We've had an honourable role to play. It may be due to the circumstances, their isolation, uh, the need to be creative. We had some early innovations. In 1854, we had our first telegraph line between Melbourne and Williamstown, the port. A lot of the, the first forays into electronics in Australia were about telecommunication. Outside of America and England, it was the first country in the world to use Morse code. Morse code revolutionised communication, and it wasn't long before those telegraph lines spread like spider's webs all around Australia. That that was the Victorian internet. The Darwin to Java undersea cable was put in place in 1871 and it was to connect to the overland telegraph line. We then had cable contact back to Europe. The businesses that used the Morse code the most was in fact the wool industry. And we had an extraordinary inventor called Henry Sutton. Henry Sutton had designed the first of the rechargeable batteries. He was very much a self-taught genius of his age. The compound telephone which we know today which has one piece came as a result of earpiece at one end, microphone at the other, all off the same magnet. That was a brilliant invention. Alexander Cram Bell comes to visit him in Ballarat. Bell had that telephone in two pieces and Henry Sutton made it in one. When you've got companies doing high-tech things. Radio was explosive in its growth through the 20s. It was vital that Australia have communications, particularly communications with the ships at sea. The whole electronics industry in that period, from 1920s onwards, was dominated by the firm AWA and by its chief scientist, Sir Ernest Fisk. So he thought he could communicate with the afterlife, with the dead, with radio. They're starting production of vacuum tubes. They're realising radio is huge. This is called a Traeger pedal. It became familiar to people on stations to use the pedal radio to communicate with the doctor, to communicate with each other. Radio in Australia is probably seen as a little bit more vital because we're it's a big continent. In Australia, during that wartime period, one of the most important developments that took place was at CSIR Radio Physics where they developed the distance measuring equipment. In World War II, Australia had developed portable radar systems for our soldiers to take into the field in jungle warfare and that was fairly extraordinary in its day. Uh, during 1946, I began to develop uh, ideas for an electronic system for computation. Towards the end of 1947, I had more or less completed a theoretical logical design for what was to become CIRAC came about because it was part of the general development across the world because there was a need for high-speed computation. CIRAC was the brainchild of Trevor Pearcy and Maston Beard. The machine was well conceived and well engineered by the team at Radio Physics. CIRAC has the greatest Australian content of any computer ever made. There were only three other computers in the world. It was a huge advance over the calculating machines, which was all they had. CIRAC was the first computer to generate music. Colonel Berge's March was the first thing, which was a very popular tune of its day. You know, da, 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 da. And that was the first use of a computer to generate music in the world. CIRAC, in later years, when it was in Melbourne, was the first computer to generate a 24-hour weather forecast. It was an extraordinary machine. It did extraordinary work. It found the centre of our galaxy. They developed games that people could play using the cathode ray screens and the flashing lights. It was a remarkable machine created and maintained by remarkable people. One of the more significant Australian inventions in electronics was the black box flight recorder. And, of course, the... Uh... 
uh, atomic absorption spectrometer, which uh, was a CSIRO development. Australia's always been in the forefront of television research. Australia kept pace. Australia kept pace with the rest of the world in this technology. The reason why biomedical is because you've got this huge centre of biomedical research here, which needs hardware and, and needs instruments and things like that. They were experimenting. There, there was the bionic ear. I have spent the greater part of my working life focused on developing what turned out to be a bionic ear or cochlear implant for profoundly deaf people. And the pacemaker. In fact, in 1971, Teletronics was the first company in the world to put a hermetically sealed pacemaker on the market. So there's certainly people doing some very clever stuff in that area. In the very late 60s, early 70s, Dick Smith came along and started up Dick Smith Electronics. I'm going to sell electronics and I'm going to do it in a revolutionary way. And then straight after that, we got the, the very first digital chips, the CD4. 4011, 4001, and this was the beginning of the digital era. Late 70s, mid 80s was sort of like the golden age of hobby electronics, I think. It was magazines, it was buying kits, there was a computer club. The first project that I built myself with some friends was the National Semiconductor Kit called the SCAP. These were times when it was really quite immense a test to get the smallest computer to do the smallest thing. There was a, an enthusiasm, almost a religious and sell it of interest in these parts. I think it was. I think that it was very exciting for people to, to be able to, to build something which used a chip. It was, it was a concept which was new. The first commercial computers were starting to come in. The Dick Smith Sorcerer, for example. Then the Australian Microbee. Unix became the thing. Australia also built the Fairlight, which is the world's first digital sampler. And Fairlight expanded. It became a, a very innovative audio editing tool for post-production. Post-production being the synchronisation of sound to image. Basically the Fairlight system is still incorporated inside the Blackmagic system these days. And Rode Microphones now, one of the world's most successful microphone manufacturers, is in Sydney. I'm particularly proud of what I did there. The NT3, which is a little pencil microphone. The CSRO's government controlled, and they've had some big intellectual property wins recently with the Wi-Fi patent which they won, which is absolutely incredible. There's been a long process of innovation and discovery.